Hey, everybody. What's up? It's Joe here. Just wanted to let you know about an upcoming class we have going in Denver. We're actually producing a Navigating Psychedelics two-day edition for all of you out there that want some in-person ed. So we just ran it in uh, Miami, and it was an amazing success. And we're going to do it again in Denver on November 10 and 11. And uh, we would love to have you there. If you want to learn about it, psychedelicstoday.com slash events. We are going to run through two days of material. We're actually even going to give you an impressive breathwork experience that hopefully helps you understand that experience and how it's useful. So anyway, go over to psychedelicstoday.com slash events to learn more. And we would love to see you there in Denver. Every year, psychedelics are becoming more accepted into mainstream culture, and people all over the world are asking themselves, how can I get the skills, foundations, and tools to build a meaningful career in psychedelics? Well, that is exactly where Vital comes in. Our 12-month interdisciplinary practitioner training program is robust, inclusive, and most of all transformative, both personally and professionally. Our graduates have gone on to do many different things in the psychedelic space, like working at ketamine clinics, consulting on clinical trials, opening a retreat center, starting their own coaching or wellness practice, and even launching a psychedelic media and merchandise platform, and so much more. Classes start January 23rd, and our application deadline is December the 20th. But if you apply and enroll before November the 19th, you'll save $750 from tuition. Head to vitalpsychedelictraining.com to download our full course curriculum. You can also check out our events page at psychedelictoday.com to sign up for an upcoming Q&A session or to join an expert-led topical taster webinar. Find out whether Vital is the transformative journey you've been looking for. Hello, everyone. Manesh Gurn, aka The Psychedelic Scientist here, letting you know about a scheduling change for the second cohort of our eight-week live-taught online course, Psychedelic Neuroscience Demystified, How Psychedelics Alter Consciousness and Produce Therapeutic Effects. This course is now starting on November 1st, so you've still got some time to enroll. The course consists of a combination of live group classes and in-depth video lectures, which will give you a solid understanding of the key concepts and findings in psychedelic neuroscience. You'll also have ample opportunity to connect with like-minded peers to discuss all of the content. We make things as accessible and relevant as possible by highlighting real-world practical applications and building from the basic to the more complex. So whether you're a mental health professional, researcher, or just interested in expanding your knowledge, This course will provide you with a deeper understanding of the neuroscience of psychedelics. Classes start on November 1st, and you can find out more information and enroll at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. This is Melanie Pincus. I'm here with Manesh Gurn as my co-host. We're taking over the Psychedelics Today podcast for just this episode. And we're here with our guest, Gould Dolan, who is Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. And to give you guys some background around why we're having this episode, In partnership with Psychedelics Today, Manesh and I designed and launched a course on psychedelic neuroscience that's a deep dive into the question of how psychedelics act on the brain to produce therapeutic effects for a wide array of clinical populations, including those with mood disorders, PTSD, OCD, eating disorders, just to name a few, and how these insights can be applied to the preparation journey and integration phases when working with these substances. And this study is out of Dr. Gold Dolan's lab in the last few years, including their recent publication in Nature, provides really tantalizing clues for how psychedelics are able to be effective across a number of different diagnoses. And I find that to be a rare phenomenon. Usually drugs target a narrow set of disorders. And so in our course, we cover goals, groundbreaking studies, and we're really excited to go into detail with you, Gull, about your studies and unpack them. And before we do that, I think a good place to start would be understanding you a little bit better and the larger questions that you've been pursuing in your academic career. So to start off with, 
Um, I wanted to ask you why you ended up studying neuroscience and then more specifically studying the neural underpinnings of sociality and especially as it relates to autism. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I, when I was an undergrad uh, at Duke University, I designed my own major because I just couldn't settle on one thing and I wasn't allowed to do a triple major. So I designed my own major and it was comparative perspectives on the mind. And it was, you know, a deep dive into that one question about mind, about consciousness. How do we know what we know? How, how do we have that sense of consciousness? And I, I took the perspective from philosophy, and neuroscience, and linguistics, and religion, and art, and I was really trying to get a handle on what do we think we know about this from all of these different points of view. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, kind of towards the middle of, of that exploration, I took this class called Drugs, Brain, and Behavior, um, which was taught by Cindy Kuhn, who's sort of a, a lasting hero of mine because she really introduced me to this topic in such a approachable and exciting way. Um, and during during the course, you know, there was a moment where, you know, I saw the 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 structure of serotonin next to a chemical structure of LSD. And I really had this moment where I was like, great, here is a compound, like a chemical, you put it in your mouth and then suddenly consciousness changes, right? And what better evidence that, you know, really in order to understand consciousness, we should be studying molecules and neurons and receptors and that really all of those big questions that I've been thinking about in philosophy come down to those kinds of chemical reactions. And that was exciting for me. And, you know, not too long after that, I, I sort of made the decision that I was going to pursue neuroscience and that, you know, the other things were interesting. And I was, you know, happy to have seen things from those perspectives, but they just weren't going to give me the answers at that sort of satisfying, you know, detailed, granular level that I was thirsting for. And so I switched to neuroscience and, um, you know, I, I've been doing it ever since. And so, you know, along the way, I decided to go to medical school. Um, and, um, you know, so when I started graduate school at MIT, uh, my advisor was like, oh, well, since you're doing an MD, PhD, you should really work on autism. And at the time, it wasn't really fashionable to do anything related to translation. You know, people really wanted you to be focused on like biophysical properties of vision and, you know, basic science questions only. And so I was a little annoyed to be pigeonholed into that, um, into that one box. But he was like, well, the project I want you to work on is, you know, on Fragile X and autism. And I remembered from some of my philosophical studies that, you know, this was an interesting way to kind of get back at that question of consciousness because people with autism have disruptions in theory of mind-like behaviors, which, you know, some philosophers think are kind of at the core of being able to understand consciousness in ourselves versus others. And so I was, I was sort of interested intellectually. And then, you know, obviously, uh, because social impairments are such a huge part of the disruption in, in autism, that increasingly became more and more my focus. Mm -hmm. Great. And a really interesting thing that you did along these lines was giving MDMA to octopuses or octopi. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how that came about and how you <laughs> had the decision or the idea to run such a study? Yeah, so I mean, it's octopuses, not octopi, because it comes from <laughs> Greek, not Latin. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just joked that, you know, they're going to either tattoo it on my forehead or put it on my tombstone, because I, I say yeah. like, it so many times. Um, yeah, so that experiment, actually, we were already in the lab working with MDMA. We were interested in it because it has these prosocial properties. And, you know, at around that time, there was a lot of hype around this idea that, you know, what, you really can't study psychedelics in animal models and that really the interesting consciousness kind of stuff about psychedelics 
you only have access to if you do those studies in humans. Um, of course, the problem in human studies is, is that mostly what you're looking at is brain imaging and, you know, people are just sort of giving psychedelics and, and showing that, oh, well, this brain region lights up and, and therefore we understand something about, um, about um, the mechanism underlying those psychedelics because, well, the amygdala lit up or the amygdala signal went down or the default mode network went up. And this was sort of the, the main... Um, take of most of the people who were doing psychedelics research at, at when I started my own lab. And so I thought it was an interesting thought experiment to say, well, what about an octopus? I mean, an octopus is so different from us, and its evolutionary history is so different from us. Our last common ancestor was 650 million years ago. We have more in common as a human with a starfish than we do with an octopus, right? And so... The idea was if the octopus responded in the same way to psychedelics as um, you know a, a mammal does, a rodent or a human does, then it really challenges some of these assumptions we've been making by giving them and looking at brain imaging. And so that's exactly what happened. And this was, I have to say, a huge surprise because you know not only are they so evolutionarily distant from us, octopuses are like you know, viciously asocial, don't believe what you saw on Netflix, like, they are not cuddly, they are not going to come up and, you know, hug you if you're going through a divorce, they're, they're mean, and they are vicious, and they will, they will, you know, kill another octopus if you put them in the same tank, right, and so, because they're so asocial, you know, we thought at most what was going to happen was they were going to give the drug, and they would, like, maybe move around more, or, you know, possibly, you know, have other elements of what MDMA does in rodents. But we were totally surprised to find that they behave basically the same and they increase their pro-social approach behaviors. And this was, you know, astonishing because it meant, you know, that all of those explanations around, you know, brain imaging, which sometimes they call blobology, you know, look at that blob that lit up, right? That, that those weren't really true and that, you know, they were true in so far as it's true for one species but not universally true across species and that given the right molecular infrastructure, a totally different looking brain could accomplish the same complex behavior. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the octopuses. So, they are quite asocial, but presumably there would be periods of time where they come together to mate where that shifts and then they are being social. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, it, it's a little bit depends on the species. So in the species we looked at, it, the octopus bimaculoides, which is also known as the California two-spot octopus, it's definitely the case that they will suspend their asociality for about two minutes or so during mating. Um, but some species are so aggressively asocial that they've never even seen the male of the species. They've just seen his hectocotylus arm just kind of float, like detached from his body and floating inside of her mantle because he's like delivered the sperm, ejected his arm, and scooted off as quickly as possible so he doesn't get eaten. Um, and then there's one species of octopus. Octopus, um, it doesn't actually have a scientific name yet. It's called the larger Pacific striped octopus. And it's the only known truly social octopus where you know they do communal living and food sharing and pair bonding and so that's there is one out of about 300 or so species of octopus that's social and so we think that it, it's interesting because octopuses are cephalopods and almost all other cephalopods are social and so it mm -hmm. suggests that there's some ancient sort of social brain circuitry existing in these animals, but that for whatever selection pressure that we don't really understand, it's sort of suppressed or turned off except during the reproductive period in octopuses. And that view is really supported by the fact that MDMA can act as a switch to turn it back on. So that's, that's interesting. So do you think that really brief window where they're overcoming their asociality to mate is somewhat similar to the state they might be in when they've been administered MDMA? Uh, 
I think so. It, it's possible. Uh, you know, we don't know. We, the, you know, I have to say that experiment has gotten so much attention, but mm -hmm. really it was just a pilot experiment that, you know, we kind of, we had the opportunity, we had all the materials, and so we, and basically I thought it was going to fail, and then when it didn't, <laughs> we just published it, and we've been, you know, playing catch-up ever since, and so, you know, we have just finished the genome of a different species of octopus that we think is going to become the sort of new model organism um, for, for, uh, for most of biology, actually, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. And so we're going to repeat all of those experiments and do a whole bunch more controls and try and get a sense of the developmental timeline and, you know, what are the drugs that block it? You know, we've got a lot of work to do to follow up on that study, but I don't have like good answers right now just because they were really pilot studies. Cool. Yeah, I just want to say, too, that that's so brave to pursue a question where you think you're going to fail, because I feel like the bias is so often in the other direction of playing it safe and doing studies where you like are pretty sure you know how it's going to turn out. So that's really <laughs> incredible yeah. of you. No, I think it's great. Like I feel like, as you described, you went into protest probably more of a conservative environment at MIT and given mm -hmm. your colleagues and people you're around and then gave MDMA to octopuses, you know? So I admire <laughs> that kind of like renegade scientist almost uh, perspective and just going out there and doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, I was at, at Johns Hopkins and I remember my department chair was like, cool. We hired you to cure autism. What the hell is this, you know, octopus MDMA? <laughs> you know, and I was like, just wait, it's going to be awesome. You'll see. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting, this concept of like vestigial functionality, like functionality that's inherited phylogenetically. And I just think of humans too, of like different, you know, depend, potential for latent kind of possibilities of different functional organization or activity in our brain, which we just don't access because it's not like ethologically relevant, right? It's not like, it's not going to be activated in our day to day. And maybe things like psilocybin or LSD or like DMT may, might activate, might be construed as activating these latent aspects of our brain, brain's functionality that are just not relevant for our survival. And so it's an interesting parallel there. Yeah. I mean, we, I can tell you what I'm most excited about with the octopuses kind of relates to the other work that we've been doing in mice. So, you know, I'm sure we're about to get into this, but I, I can just say that, you know, we found this, um, you know, we've been studying critical periods. I've actually been studying critical periods since I was a graduate student at MIT. Then it was like the visual systems critical period, ocular dominance plasticity. And I've been obsessed with critical periods for a long time for exactly the reason that you, you brought up. Like the idea with the critical period is, is that there are, just not enough genes to encode every single behavior that we might need to use in our lifetime, right? Like there's just not enough genes to encode every possible language that we might need to speak. Instead, there are genes that encode the ability to learn a language and critical windows of time where your ability to be sensitive to your language environment, for example, where you can learn whatever is relevant to the environment you happen to live in, right? So if you grew up in the United States, then probably you're learning English and maybe some Spanish. But, you know, if you grow up somewhere else, you know, you don't learn English. You learn, say, Japanese or Turkish or um, some other language. And so that mechanism is sort of ingenious because it really expands the behavioral repertoire available to an animal without taking up the genetic or, you know, neural circuit um, infrastructure to encode every single one of them. So one interesting question with the octopuses is, you know, octopuses are sort of strange amongst invertebrates because they are, comp you know, really capable of a pretty diverse array of behaviors and their behaviors are very complex and they are you know under cognitive control and flexible and adaptable to their environment and so you know josh rosenthal at the uh, woods hole marine biological laboratory um has has recently been showing a lot of cool things with you know that adaptability, that behavioral adaptability, the ability to live in, 
you know, sort of really, really, really cold, deep ocean temperatures and also subtropical waters, that there might be totally novel genetic mechanisms that enable diversification of that behavioral repertoire. And so what I'm excited about is, A, do octopuses have critical periods? Because they might not, right? Like they can regrow their arms, so they might not need to restrict learning to a specific window. Josh is showing these cool things that they seem to be able to change up their behavior radically across their whole lifetime. Um, and so if they have critical periods, are there new mechanisms that we haven't seen in mammals before for enabling them to be opened up under the right circumstances? So that's another area that we definitely want to pursue. And having the MDMA sort of pilot study that shows us that these drugs can induce behave robust behavioral changes really you know, sets us off and gives us the toolkit we need to start asking those questions in a more systematic way. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. What a fascinating species to study. And just, uh, yeah, it's, it's super curious. Like we're talking about, you know, translation from humans to octopuses, but what about octopuses to humans? And, you know, how much of, of that um, molecular infrastructure, as you call it, is conserved so that we find something that, you know, unlocks a particular type of behavior or ability to change in octopuses and then using that to develop things in humans. That's a fascinating thing to consider. Yeah. A lot of people are excited about that. I mean, you know, people are excited about that for like tissue bioengineering and trying to make invisibility cloaks and robotics because, you know, octopuses don't use like joints the way that we do. Their, their whole mm -hmm. movement program is based on something similar to our tongue. So they have a muscular hydrostat. And so, you know, a lot of the robotics people are excited about, you know, making flexible robots uh, based on, you know, how the octopuses solve those problems. Um, the, just a few things outside of, you know, the stuff I care about. But yeah, they're, they're fascinating. Yeah, so cool. So cool. That is reminding me of a VR experience I did this past year where I got to, my avatar was an octopus and I got to move through space as an octopus and it was deeply satisfying in a way I could not have imagined before having the experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's some, there's some like meme that was going around a, a while back about like, would you rather be, um, what was it like, invisible or could fly? And, you know, I, I always answered that with obviously to fly. I mean, you know, who wants to be invisible? Most women are invisible anyway. It sucks. <laughs> right? So I'd rather, I'd rather be able to fly. And then I remembered, mm -hmm. well, actually, I was a scuba diver for a little while after college. I worked as an underwater photographer mm. for the excavation of a shipwreck. And, you know, scuba diving is a little bit like flying because, you know, you get to move around in 3D space and, you know, you're using a whole different set of, you know, spatial, um, yeah, configurations to get places. It's, it's fun. And, yeah, definitely flying. <laughs> and octopuses definitely get to walk and fly. So they're, they're really cool. Mm. Right. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm wondering if this is a good moment to dive more into the critical periods work and you provided a really beautiful explanation of critical periods and I'm wondering if maybe we could have you provide some more specific examples of critical periods and then also curious about the question of like, if we have these critical periods open, especially in early development, why do they close? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of critical periods since their first discovery. The first one was discovered, or rather described, um, in 1935 by Conrad Lorenz. And this is that imprinting behavior in snow geese where, you know, they will form a long, lifelong attachment to whatever's in their immediate environment and moving around within 48 hours of hatching. And that, that attachment can, you know, typically would be to the mother, but if the mother isn't around, then it could be to any flying object, it could be to a surrogate parent, it could be to a scientist, it could be to a, you know, motorized airplane. And, 
that window of time where they're extremely sensitive to what's in their environment and can form a lifelong attachment is what Conrad Lorenz called a critical period. And it was purely behavioral. Um, since then, you know, there have been a lot of other critical periods described. Um, probably the one that everybody's most familiar with is language, as I already mentioned. But also critical periods for the visual system, for the touch system, for the motor system. And my lab, you know, really got interested in that, this idea that there might be a critical period for social learning, right? And this social reward learning critical period that we described in the first paper, the 2019 Nature paper, you know, that was really, we, we think it relates to, you know, in humans, the fact that, you know, teenagers just love social interactions. They care about their friends a huge, huge amount. They're constantly learning from their social environment and taking their cues from their friends. It's why they're so much more susceptible to peer pressure. Um, but, you know, as you get older, that, that caring about what your friends think and the peer pressure element really fades. And, you know, you stop caring, you know, if you have the exact right shade of you know, acid wash jeans and you start wearing the ones that are like more comfortable and you don't care if they're not as cute and, you know, you, you kind of just get over it and that's easy, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I found being a teenager to be painful and the mean girls at my school made me eat lunch by myself. Like I hated it. I hated being that sensitive to what other people think about me and it's a relief. And I think that kind of gets at, um, the answer to why they close, right? They are, it is energetically costly to be learning from your environment in that intense way. It is emotionally draining to care that much. And, you know, at some point you just kind of learn the rules and it's time to move on with other things that need your attention and focus. And, you know, habits get a bad rap, but they really do allow us to navigate our environment with, you know, a huge amount of efficiency, right? Like not having to figure out the best route between your keys, the door, the car every single time. And you just kind of do some stuff by rote. And probably there was a lot of evolutionary selection pressure, you know, to not get eaten by, you know, a saber tooth, whatever, you know. And so um, to, to, to really start to rely on habits as you, as you get older. So I think that's why critical periods close. Right. It's, it's interesting because you can think of how, you know, the level, the degree to which what you internalize is adaptive is going to vary across people and depending on what stimuli you receive, right? Particularly for these social ones and these more um, ones that might impact mental health in different ways. So you can totally see that if you, you know, depending on the nature of the inputs or stimuli you're exposed to, you can internalize these maladaptive ways of functioning that are then uh, kind of like hard-coded into your brain and hard to escape from. And mm -hmm. I suppose this is one of the major reasons why scientists, as you mentioned earlier, have long been interested in finding ways to open them back up and like restore this ability to change in ways that previously you thought you maybe you're stuck with for life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this has actually been an intuition that neuroscientists have had almost since the beginning of the discovery of critical periods that, you know, the reason that we're so terrible at curing diseases of the brain is because by the time we get around to intervening, the relevant critical period has already closed. And so there have been, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of studies, three Nobel Prizes given to try and understand the mechanisms of critical periods and using that information to figure out, you know, safe and effective ways to reopen them. And in fact, when I was in graduate school, you know, we were very much, um, you know, debating at the time whether or not a master key that could unlock lots of different critical periods could even exist. And I have to say, I did not believe that such a thing could exist because based on what we understood about critical periods at the time, we thought, well, okay, we know that there are three major mechanisms that people think constrain critical periods to these windows of time. One of them is something called metaplasticity. Another is called uh, inhibitory excitatory balance or EI balance. 
um, which is just basically the maturation of inhibitory neurons. And then the third one is laying down of this extracellular matrix, which you can kind of think of as the, the glue between neurons that sort of locks in the, the memories into place. And I had the, the intuition at the time that, you know, anything that could undo those mechanisms that constrain learning and memory as the brain matures would either cause, you know, seizures or amnesia or possibly, um, you know, cause the structural integrity of the brain to fall apart. And so I was really just, you know, very much against the idea that we would ever find a master key. Um, so I uh, was very surprised when we first started doing our psychedelic study to find out that I was maybe wrong about that. It seems mm, like so this cool. is a running theme, too, with your octopus study <laughs> also thinking yeah. that might fail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you're not, I think that, you know, a lot of scientists will tell you this, that you know, if you're not failing a lot in your mm. experiments, you're not asking big enough questions, right? Like mm. it's sort, and it would be boring, I think, to always be only doing experiments where you're basically right all the time. You know what's going to happen, you know. So I'm always looking for questions, and and what I always tell my students is, the best type of question that you could come up with for a project is something that is going to tell you something interesting no matter mm. what happens mm. with the experiment, right? So if it works, then it's interesting and surprising. And if it doesn't work, it should tell you something else that is interesting and surprising. And that's, to me, the, the, the most beautiful experimental design when you, when you hit on one of those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um... It kind of reminds me too of the entrepreneurial world where the idea is to fail fast and you actually learn the most when you do fail and the wisdom is really in pivoting as quickly as possible to the next learning challenge. So Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, except that we, we maybe in basic science would call it failing slow because, <laughs> you know, these things, these things take a long time. Like people are often surprised and how much patience you have to have to be able to do these experiments. Like each one of these nature papers took us four to five years um, from beginning to end. And, you know, there's hundreds of experiments, hundreds of moments where you're going down the decision tree and you're like, well, if this doesn't work, then we're going to end up having to rethink, you know, the first 47 things that we assumed, right? And it's it can be very scary um, and frustrating. And I have to really give a shout out to my postdoc, Roman, who mm. is both really, really tenacious and um, <laughs> is good at like kind of seeing the extraneous detail that doesn't matter and laser focusing on this weird thing happened and I think it might mean something rather mm. than this weird thing happened and I now I don't believe anything or now I, you know, believe the wrong thing. And so, you know, being a good scientist is, is the talent of being stubborn and tenacious and being able to find a gold nugget in a pile of mud, you know, so. Mm -hmm. True story. Totally. So the critical periods you've mentioned in your papers are characterized by this metaplasticity, which you mentioned earlier. And so I'm hoping you could also shed some light for our listeners about what would be the difference between a substance that heightens plasticity, say, and one that induces more of a metaplastic state and opens a critical period. And then also when we're thinking about the therapeutic potential of different drugs or substances, would one be perhaps better than the other? Right. So this is this is something that I'm so glad you asked because it's kind of, you know, one of the things that I want people to really appreciate and come away with understanding after they've heard me speak, because I think right now there's this sort of the dumb money is behind this idea that psychedelics are just, you know, inducing plasticity and more and plasticity is related to learning. So more plasticity is better and plasticity, plasticity, plasticity. And mm -hmm. neuroscientists went down that road, you know, in the early 90s and well into the 2000s. 
And what decades of research has taught us is that no, more plasticity isn't always better. And just like more growth sometimes means cancer, right? More plasticity and unregulated plasticity sometimes means addiction, right? And so you get massive when you take drugs of abuse like cocaine and amphetamine and meth and alcohol and nicotine and heroin, they all cause massive induced plasticity. And so you see the change in this chain in the architecture of the neurons in the connections between neurons and it's massive so you know 20 percent 30 percent changes in, in these things and we have as neuroscientists come to appreciate that those kinds of big changes are nothing like the subtler changes that happen in spine morphology when you learn something and also as the brain is maturing and so as the brain is maturing what changes is not just the number and shape of the, the neurons, but also, and this is what metaplasticity means, the ability to induce plasticity. So when you're young, because of the molecules and the structure of the receptors and the coupling of those receptors to different biochemical programs within the cell, and because of things like extracellular matrix and inhibition and modulation from things like dopamine and serotonin, that the ability to induce plasticity changes over time. It's much easier to induce pl plasticity in juvenile brains compared to adult brains. And that change over development is called metaplasticity, the plasticity of plasticity, right? That's how it's defined. And so what we have found is, is that whereas drugs of abuse like cocaine induce um, hyperplasticity or like too much plasticity, psychedelics don't induce that hyperplasticity. Instead, what they do is they induce metaplasticity. So they change, they restore in an adult brain the ability to induce plasticity to levels that are more similar to juveniles. And a question I have is because the focus in your papers have been on the nucleus accumbens, right, which is an area in a reward system and that's very involved in um, social reward learning as you know you focused on. Um, but what about outside of the reward system? What about the plasticity changes in association cortex or, you know, in these other, in these cortical areas outside of the cumbens and reward system? Would you say yeah. it's likely to be metaplasticity there too, or is it a, a different mechanism of neuroplasticity? Well, I mean, metaplasticity was actually first described um, in the visual cortex um, as a explanation for uh, ocular dominance plasticity. So metaplasticity is a ubiquitous um, phenomenon that occurs in most brain regions. There are some brain regions that continue sort of to grow and divide neurons well into adulthood. And, you know, I think so those those neurons, it's not really metaplasticity because if they're baby neurons that just keep getting born, then they just stay in that kind of juvenile state forever. It's not technically, it's not really metaplasticity, but you know, you get the point. Um, as far as our focus on the nucleus accumbens, I, I would never want anybody to get the impression that we were suggesting that our mechanisms are restricted to the nucleus accumbens. There's absolutely no reason to believe that psychedelics aren't having similar effects out, you know, on metaplasticity outside of the the brain. However, I would I would just ask people to exercise caution when they read a paper and they, you know, see, oh, well, psychedelics are inducing plasticity. And then you look a little bit deeper and you realize that the studies were done in cultured neurons because cultured neurons are basically baby neurons in a dish and that dish is missing the inhibitory neurons, it's missing the serotonin inputs, it's missing the extracellular matrix, and it's missing the molecular signature of an adult neuron. And so what neuroscientists have known for many years is, is that under those conditions, you can induce plasticity, hyperplasticity in fact, and it's not really what the function of the drug would be um, under normal circumstances is a technical artifact of having stripped the neurons of all of those regulatory mechanisms that constrain plasticity you know, in an intact adult brain, right? And so we've seen a couple of reports where people have said, oh, look, we bath applied psychedelics and we got this massive change in the dendritic arborization, huge number of spines, 
And then, you know, they did all five of the experiments in culture, and then the last experiment they did in vivo and expect you to believe that the mechanisms are related to each other. And I think that those kinds of experiments, they may be true, but they are technical artifacts of the, of the culture system. And we have not been able to reproduce those kinds of findings in an adult brain in an ex vivo study. And so I would really ask people to exercise caution in the way that they interpret those those studies of neurons in a dish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really fair point. Um, I'm wondering if we could go into a little bit more detail about the MDMA study in 2019 that you your lab published in Nature and give listeners a sense of how you designed that study to look at this social reward learning period and how the findings in mice in that study might have some parallels to humans in studies with MDMA and psychedelic therapy. Yeah, um, sure. So the studies in, the, in that first paper in mice were really different from the way that we did the studies in octopuses. So in octopuses, we gave MDMA and then we were just measuring what was the behavioral effect, what was the behavioral change induced immediately while the animals were still on MDMA. Um, the study that we, the, that we did in mice first in the 2019 study, um, there what we're doing is we're giving MDMA to an adult animal and then we're waiting for 48 hours. So we're waiting for all the MDMA to wash out and the acute subjective effects to wear off and the liver metabolites to wear off. And we're just measuring what happened under sort of sober conditions to their ability to learn from their social environment again. And so we use that same social reward learning assay that we can't use to characterize the critical period. And in adults, what we find is, is that they are, if they're not pretreated with MDMA or if they're pretreated with saline, or, then, then they aren't able to learn from their social environment in that way that they could as juveniles. Mm -hmm. But when we pretreated them with MDMA, then that ability to learn for their social environment came back. And so they were restored. And we call that coming back of the reopen uh, of the uh, behavioral uh, learning um, to be a reopening of that critical period. And so that was super exciting to us for a couple of reasons. One is that, um, you know, phenomenologically, it seemed to parallel this report that we saw in a lot of the clinical trials of PTSD uh, patients receiving psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, where they would say things like, you know, I felt open, I felt able to connect with my therapist, I felt able to connect with myself, and I felt able to discuss things that I had, you know, kept under wraps for so many years. And so we thought, well, that, that sounds familiar. The other part of it that was really, really surprising, and I think this is maybe the most important um, difference between this critical period type of explanation and the biochemical model that you might hear from some others. And so the, the main thing that we were focused on is, is that, well, you know, it's not like people are taking MDMA and going to a rave and suddenly all of their, um, or going to Burning Man and suddenly all of their PTSD is gone, right? It really is under these very controlled circumstances where they're getting a couple of days of therapy, really investigating what is the source of the trauma. Then during the trip, you know, they're mostly just kind of tripping, but their mindset and their setting have already been set around this therapeutic intention. And then afterwards, you know, during the integration phase, they're really still in that therapeutic context. And so this context dependence of psychedelics, therapeutic efficacy, I think is both the most exciting thing and probably the reason why they, these drugs have such lasting effects, right? We're not just treating the symptoms of depression with an SSRI and numbing the, the pain. People are actually able to sort of resolve the learned pattern of behaviors, unlearn them, relearn them, recontextualize them, and then um, they're cured for life. The durability of these effects is pretty remarkable. And so what we found is, is that just like those therapeutic effects of MDMA, the 
uh, ability to reopen the social critical period is dependent on the social context. So if we gave MDMA and we, but we gave them to the animals while they were sitting by themselves in a cage, then they weren't able to reopen the social critical period. And to my knowledge, this is the only study or, you know, this and the one that we did as a follow up are the only studies that recapitulate that context dependence of psychedelics effects and everything else that you've read about, like, oh, well, they have these antidepressant properties or, oh, they have these anxiolytic properties or, oh, they have these properties that, you know, make them good for treating headaches or inflammation. All of those kinds of effects are context independent. They happen whether you're in a, you know, therapeutic setting or you're at a rave or whatever, right? And to me, it, any explanation of the therapeutic effects of these drugs really has to address that element of it because it has such a big impact on the way that we think about how we might implement these drugs in, in a clinical setting, right? And so if you are the kind of person who believes in the old, what I consider to be the now outdated, mostly old fashioned view that, you know, depression is just a biochemical imbalance in serotonin and all you have to do is take, um, you know, an SSRI and you can rebalance yourself and then you'll just be on SSRIs for the rest of your life. Like, I don't think that many neuroscientists really believe that anymore, but the chemists are still pushing that idea and the chemists are really viewing psychedelics as, you know, just next generation SSRIs that work faster, but basically are just restoring that balance, right? And that I think does not accurately capture the clinical results that we've had with psychedelics, right? So I'll just say one more thing about this, which is that, you know, the MAPS trials for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, now the second phase three trial just got published last week. Right. In both cases, in both of those papers, they showed remarkable like doubling of it, of uh, efficacy compared to psychotherapy alone, right? In contrast, in the studies that were done by Compass Pathways and a couple of other groups where they did not emphasize the psychedelics um, as a sort of adjunct to psychotherapy, mm. but really use psychedelics in the same way that SSRIs are being used, then the efficacy was no different from SSRIs, right? So they were sort of psilocybin for major depression. Now, granted, psilocybin and depression are different from MDMA and um, and PTSD. So some would argue the difference is just in the in the compound and the disease. But as I'll tell you about in a minute, like we don't think there's that much of a difference between MDMA and psilocybin. And so I and I think that you know the real difference between those studies was the emphasis of context. Or in the case of the psilocybin for depression studies, what they were really doing is just kind of the therapist is there just to kind of um, support people in case they have a bad trip. It wasn't the primary therapy. It was really a comparison between this drug versus that drug and is really taking a very old fashioned view of depression, which I think is why those trials were not successful. Mm, yeah, thank, thank you so much for that. Like there's so much there, right? And I think mm -hmm. I've been saying for a long time, and I think you would agree, like psych psychedelics necessitate like a biopsychosocial framework where you're looking at all these, you know, uh, extra pharmacological contextual factors. And it's cool. Yeah, your, your work really shows a mechanistic basis for that with the whole idea of metaplasticity and even the context depends of the uh, context dependence of the effects you're seeing, because if you're not you know, um, engaging in the right, uh, we're not receiving the right information or stimuli or inputs, it's not going to change those neuroplastic adaptation, adaptations in the way that you want it to do, to do that. And like there's papers, as you kind of alluded to, um, questioning how much is psychotherapy even needed for psychedelics, you know, and it's like this strong gravitational pull of the kind of you know, neuro reductionist biochemical framework of like the old guard of psychiatry, as I like to call it. And, you know, I feel like just like psychedelics are so powerful in helping to precipitate this new perspective of, hey, you know, people's experiences matter, your environment matters. It's not just we're not just these kind of brains, this free floating brains, you just operate on the brain level. And that's all that matters.
Um, and I think it's interesting too that you guys did ketamine because ketamine is there's so many ketamine clinics in, in the States and in North America and it's often administered in this pharmacotherapy model or just like pharmacological model. You go in there, you're given high dose ketamine, which is an intense experience and then you're like, oh, we'll call you a taxi, you can go home and no mention of the experience, right? And even though the critical period I think was to 48 hours, quite like short, but that's a huge opportunity for different, for, for like using adjunctive interventions and practices because you'll be more receptive to them. And you're like, think about all the efficacy that's like lost just by people just not acknowledging these other factors. And this whole thing goes hand in hand with serotonin because we know from a lot, lot of research with serotonin is that it enhances environmental sensitivity. And even SSRIs enhance environmental sensitivity. And we know that SSRIs coupled with CBT is much better than either individually. And so there's like a synergistic interaction in general with serotonergic drugs, which is also, I mean, not acknowledged as much, um, but also it's like, I guess, therapeutic resources. But I think there's so much here around it, just like, and, and I love that you brought that perspective. Yeah, well, you jumped ahead to the next paper, so <laughs> so maybe yeah, I should just summarize a couple of the things that we found in the next paper, just to catch the audience up to what, what Manesh alluded to. Um, so, you know, when we finished that first 2019 paper, we basically thought, well, this is because MDMA is a pro-social drug and we're looking at a social critical period and it's something unique to this drug. Um, we had done the control experiment where we wanted to see whether cocaine could also reopen the critical period and it didn't, which was somewhat reassuring because cocaine isn't used in this therapeutic setting. Um, and, you know, also differentiates our view from, say, the sort of biochemical view, which, you know, says that psychedelics are psychoplastogens, a word I hate, uh, because cocaine is a psychoplastogen and yet it doesn't have these therapeutic effects, right? And so the fact that cocaine didn't reopen was very reassuring. So, but then when we did the other experiments where we looked at all the other psychedelics, where again, I was sure that none of the other psychedelics were gonna reopen this critical period. And then, whoa, lo and behold, all of them did it. It really challenged our framework of understanding this because what it said is, is that this isn't just something special to a psychedelic that has pro-social properties, but rather generalizes across all psychedelics. And what was interesting is, you know, the psychedelics we looked at, we chose them on purpose because we wanted to test this idea that you brought up about the central role of serotonin. Um, because as I mentioned, you know, that's kind of how I got into psychedelics too, comparing the psychedelic right. to a serotonin molecule. And so we picked psychedelics that were, psych you know, kind of spread across the, the diversity of receptors. So, you know, we looked at the psychedelics that are serotonin 2A receptor binding. So things like psilocybin and LSD. Um, we also looked at things like ketamine, which are not serotonin psychedelics. So they bind to a different receptor altogether, a glutamate receptor called the NMDA receptor. Um, we looked at MDMA, which binds to the serotonin transporter and a couple of other transporters as well. And then we looked at ibogaine, which is really sort of a weird one. We don't really understand where its mechanisms lie. You know, some people have focused on the kappa opioid receptor. There's also some evidence that they also activate the serotonin transporter. So we really don't know, but it doesn't seem to be a serotonin psychedelic the way the rest of them are. And so, uh, at least a subset of them are. And so we were really surprised that they all reopened this critical period Period. And what it suggested to us is, is that what it feels like to reopen a critical period is just what it feels like to be in that altered state of consciousness that's shared across all of the psychedelics, right? And so that first clue was that they all did it. And then the second clue was that um, it kind of didn't matter what receptor they bound to, they all did it. There's also other differences across them. And the most important one to our mind is that, that they act at different uh, time scales. So as you mentioned, ketamine is very short acting. You know, people take ketamine and they have the effects for about 30 minutes to two hours, whereas, you know, LSD, the trip lasts about 10 hours. MDMA and psilocybin are more like three to six hours, and ibogaine is sort of the way outlier. It, it really um, lasts for three days for some people, right? And we had some rough sense that that difference in the duration of the acute subjective effects is 
sort of proportional to the durability of the therapeutic effects, but we didn't really know what that was about. So we knew that the way that ketamine is being used in a sort of context independent way, um, it's just kind of short acting. Most people, um, you know, start to feel depressed again after four or five days, and then you have to have another shot of ketamine. And in contrast, these long lasting effects were really the property of these long lasting um, psychedelic experiences. So we wondered, is there a relationship between the duration of the acute subjective effects and the duration of the critical period open state? And what we found is that there was. So the ones that are, you know, opening the critical period, the shortest are the ones that have the shortest acute subjective effects. So ketamine, whereas the ones that keep the critical period open the longest, so for like four weeks or longer, um, like Ibogaine, are also the ones that are, you know, having the longest acute subjective effects. And so the way that we're interpreting those results is, is that um, what this means is, is that the reason that Ibogaine is so effective uh, or, you know, there's a lot of pilot evidence suggesting that it's really, you know, our best chance for diseases like heroin addiction, where the, you know, trauma that's associated with that addiction, where the sort of types of memories that are all around the heroin use pattern and the habits that have formed around that addiction are really entrenched, then it helps to have a really long open state of the critical periods because it enables you to kind of resolve lots of different memories that are embedded in lots of different parts of your um, nervous system. In contrast, ketamine, we think, you know, is is being misused and could there's like a missed opportunity um, to kind of pair it with a psychiatric or a, you know, psychotherapeutic context to kind of really take advantage of the fact that the critical period even there lasts well beyond the acute subjective effects for 48 hours and you know it's really kind of coming down around four days but you know it's still open and we can imagine using it back to back and trying to get an extended critical period open state um, by doing that although we didn't do that experiment specifically sweet um I'm wondering, too, if you could tell us about what your study's findings suggest is the, this downstream mechanism by which these different psychedelics are all serving as this way of unlocking critical periods, this master key. Yeah. So, I mean, as I sort of alluded to, we kind of went in thinking that, you know, everything's going to come down to the serotonin 2A receptor or something immediately downstream of that receptor called the beta arrestin signaling cascade. And once again, we were wrong. So, you know, those two things are important for some, but not all. So serotonin 2A is a mechanism, but it's not the universal mechanism. So all those drug companies out there who are hyper-focused on that one receptor are barking up the wrong tree in our view. And even the chemists who are trying to redefine psychedelics as being only the true psychedelics um, are binding to the serotonin receptor. We think that's hogwash as well. And so we were stumped though, because, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what the, what the universal mechanism was that could account for all of these different drugs, binding at different receptors, activating different biochemical signaling cascades, how they could all be doing this. And so we had to turn to a somewhat more, um, modern approach, um, which was to do, RNA sequencing in the um, nucleus accumbens, and we took advantage of the fact that we had, you know, all these different drugs and all of these different time courses of these drugs to really separate, you know, conditions where they received a drug but it was in an open state versus received a drug and it was in a closed state or received a drug and it was psychedelic or received a drug and it was not psychedelic like cocaine. And when we did that analysis, what was incredible is, is that we came up with a list of roughly 65 genes that were all up or down regulator of change in their expression levels um, in the open state of the critical period compared to the closed state of the critical period. And of those 65 genes, roughly 20% of them were either part of the extracellular matrix 
or regulators of the extracellular matrix. And that to us was super exciting because even though we were focused on the nucleus accumbens, you know, this idea that the extracellular matrix is being remodeled as the critical period gets reopened comes from studies in the visual cortex, right? And so the fact that it was the same mechanism for this critical period as it was, and in this brain region compared to, you know, ocular dominance plasticity and a critical period in the visual cortex really suggested to us that this is a universal mechanism that psychedelics are tapping into. And it suggests that I was wrong and that, you know, <laughs> again, um, and that, you know, psychedelics might actually be that master key for unlocking lots of different critical periods. And I, you know, I have some ideas about how psychedelics can circumvent what I've been calling the melty brain problem. Um, and I, you know, and I think it's because they have this thing which, you know, all of the drug companies are seeing as a glitch but I actually think is a feature, which is this context dependence, right? So the fact that the drugs are context dependent means that you're only going to reorganize the extracellular matrix and the, um, you know, network of, you know, uh, synaptic plasticity at these synapses within these circuits um, in the subset of, you know, circuits and synapses that are relevant to that particular context or that set of memories. And because you're sort of fine tuning it in that way, I think it somehow circumvents this, this problem of structural instability or amnesia or, um, and, and so we're gonna spend the next like 10 years trying to figure out how the neurons know what context they're in. Hmm. Fascinating. So your studies were presumably done with mice that were healthy and were able to take advantage, let's say, of their critical periods the first time around before trying to reopen the critical period with psychedelics. So I'm curious if you are planning on performing these kinds of experiments with mice, let's say, that experience chronic stress and may have had brain circuits develop in different ways during their critical periods, let's say, around attachment, um, social reward learning type of periods you're talking about, or um, had their timing of critical windows shifted in some abnormal way, and seeing if psychedelics are still effective for those kinds of um, mice. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. There, There is some suggestion that, you know, if you have a trauma during, the, during childhood while your critical period is open, um, it's possible that your critical periods close earlier uh, around that trauma or that the traumatic memory itself becomes so much more entrenched and di more difficult to treat later on because you had that experience while everything was in the open state. I would just say that, you know, there is there are some people out there who are like such psychedelics enthusiasts that they want us to think, oh, this is just gonna cure everything and that, you know, we can give it to people and they'll love everybody and take care of the earth and, mm -hmm. you know, social justice and blah, blah, blah. I, I just don't think that that's true. I think psychedelics are much more agnostic than that. They will, they enable learning, and if you teach somebody something terrible and traumatic um, during the open state, you'll learn it much better than if you were in the closed state. And if you teach them something great, you will that will also be um, something that they can learn. But I don't think that the valence or the there's anything like the posit like that 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 psychedelics lean towards the positive experience. I just I, in general I think that that is you know it's something that we need to continue to research. But that's my intuition, just based on the fact that you know n during normal learning and memory, as you said, you know if you're exposed to a bad environment or a psychopath or you know an abusive parent or whatever, then you know those are bad experiences that you know the critical period doesn't care. It'll learn whatever's, whatever's available to it, right? Um, so in terms of like how we're imagining looking at this, I also want to just say that, you know, keeping a critical period open indefinitely is probably also not a good idea. We have some evidence to suggest that, you know, autism could be a disease where 
um, the critical period fails to close properly. Now, there have been some anecdotal reports and one study showing that, you know, psychedelics can attenuate social anxiety, but actually social anxiety is not a core symptom of autism. It's just a subset seen in some subtypes of autism, but it's not a core symptom. And so I am, you know, before I would want to jump into an autism study with psychedelics, I would really want to make sure that we're not giving these medicines to people who are, you know, I would want to do it in mice um, to make sure that we're not going to mess things up by, you know, reopening a critical period in an animal whose critical period didn't close properly to begin with, right? So it's, it's, I think we should think about that and, and act cautiously before we move forward there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because I wonder, you know, other socially uh, based disorders like what the DSM calls oppositional defiance disorder, which basically usually just refers to unruly kids and they have to make a disorder out of it. But um, so stuff like that where they potentially, you know, given a suboptimal family system or environment, they've internalized behavior patterns that are not you know, not uh, they're antisocial in some way. So I wonder if rather than autism, where there might be some, you know, dysfunction in the critical period itself developmentally, but like outside of that, in terms of other, like in terms of instances where we could say bad social learning happening, if that would be the first place to go to like translate these. So yeah, what do you think? Well, on that? I mean, honestly, like I think that that's interesting and certainly doable. And the personality disorders are especially hard to treat because they're learned patterns of behavior and it's really hard to get people to unlearn them. And so kind of getting back to this idea of why we are so terrible at treating um, neuropsychiatric diseases, because by the time we get around to recognizing those maladaptive patterns of behavior, the relevant critical period is closed. So that that's, I think, an obvious one. But I, I will say that where my lab is headed is we're, we're kind of trying to go further a field than that, because what we think is, is that if we're right about this, psychedelics are the master key for unlocking critical periods, then, you know, the fact that we've unlocked a social critical period with a social context mm -hmm. might just be a red herring, that this isn't about social per se, and that rather, you know, if we wanted to unlock a language critical period, we would change the language context. If we wanted to unlock a motor critical period, we would un change the motor context. And then the social context wouldn't really matter because the thing that we're trying to teach is, is something different, a different modality. And so we are in the process of doing those experiments to look at whether we can reopen a motor critical period with a motor context. And the reason that that's so interesting is because... Just like everything else, there's a critical period for learning motor behaviors. And when you have a stroke, a lot of times um, you will interfere with those motor be learned motor behaviors. But a critical period will open up right after you have this stroke for about three months, two, two to three months. And you can learn some things over again right after the stroke. But like other critical periods, that post-stroke critical period closes. And so most people don't get enough physical therapy um, during that open window right after the stroke to recover full function um, in, in their motor learning. And so the idea would be that if we could take somebody who had a stroke like six months ago and give them psychedelics and then pair that psychedelic therapy with a rehabilitation physical therapy then we could give them the right context and we could restore motor function and I think if we were able to do that first of all it would help something like 400,000 stroke patients in the United States every single year which is a big deal but also it would really I think cement this idea that really the utility of psychedelics is pairing it with the therapy and that the therapy is the principle and the psychedelic is just the adjunct therapy that makes that learning so much easier. And so the way I would frame it is, is that right now we're at a kind of debate point between the biochemical model and the learning model of how not just depression, PTSD, but every disorder of the brain is in some sense a learning 
a, a disruption in the learned patterns, and that if psychedelics are not just restoring a biochemical imbalance but enabling learning, then we can unlearn, and that would, or relearn, um, and that would really be a, a paradigm shift in our way of understanding why psychedelics are useful in so many different therapeutic contexts and what other diseases and non-diseases we might be able to use psychedelics to help treat. Mm. So yeah, that's the, wonderful. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. The reopening of the critical period with stroke, that's part of your Fathom project, is that correct? Yeah, so Fathom, we, you know, because doctors love these like crazy <laughs> acronyms, um, is psychedelic healing, adjunct therapy, harnessing open malleability. And, you know, I came up with that kind of in my sleep and I loved it because it was, you know, Fathom is a unit of length under the water and, and the ocean. And, you know, I'm obsessed with the ocean and octopuses. And I love the idea of mm. taking something unfathomable and making mm. it fathomable. Mm. Um, and, you know, um, and then we're pairing up with the with the neurologist Steve Zeiler and John Krakauer. And they've got this mind pod um, video game that they're using that is a dolphin and, you know, hopefully, you know, someday it'll be an octopus. Um, you know, it's this underwater imagery. So I really like the idea of the fathom um, as the name of this, this set of studies that we're doing to try and test this idea. Cool. Did they just happen to have developed the rehabilitation program a with a dolphin avatar or did you inform yeah, yeah. that, that was, piece no no that had nothing to do with that they they had just done that on their own and even you know like i i mean basically the way that we found each other because i didn't know about this because you know reopening a critical period is a big deal and in stroke the only way to reopen the motor learning critical period after stroke is to give another stroke. It's not really very, mm, mm. <laughs> nobody's going to try and cure a stroke with another stroke, right? It's not right. clinically very useful. And so people had been looking for a way to reopen. And, you know, some people were suggesting, oh, well, maybe if we give SSRIs, it'll keep them open longer. But it definitely can't reopen. And in fact, it's not even clear that it keeps it open longer. And so, you know, John and I were at a graduate student recruitment dinner and, you know, had a couple too many wines and started talking about this stuff. And that's how we sort of got together and figured out that, oh, well, you know, there's this, this very therapeutically relevant um, critical period that, you know, there's reason to, to get excited that psychedelics could, could unlock this one as well. And are you guys far along in data collection for that? Are you getting ready to publish anything i'm just curious yeah how well so we are right now we've we've got a bunch of interesting pilot experiments in the mice but we have to keep going on the mouse studies but we're so excited about this and there are enough differences in this particular type of learning and memory between a mouse and a human that um you know we sort of are excited and there's no treatment right so like if the, like there's no reason not to be moving this forward in humans in parallel because it just mm -hmm. takes so much time and we're raising you know we need to raise about a million dollars to do the human trial and so I we're see. kind of moving both projects forward in parallel and you know if any of your listeners wants to give us a million bucks um <laughs> they can look up the fathom project on my website and it can link it'll send you to a link to the donation page and yeah, I mean, we really, we really are preparing to do that trial. First, a safety trial, and then an efficacy trial in humans in parallel. Awesome. Okay, so we'll have to stay tuned to the findings from those set of studies. Super cool. Um, one thing I wanted to circle back to, and then Manash, maybe you could have time for one more question, um, is, okay, so the finding from your most recent Nature paper about how the duration of the critical period reopening being proportional to the duration of the acute subjective effects for the different psychedelics, um, yeah, I can imagine somebody taking in that information and then saying, oh, hey, like, ibogaine has the longest period of the critical period reopening, like I'm going to get the most bang for my buck. And you mentioned this too, that like maybe that is part of why it's so effective for these more difficult to treat um, addictions like to 
opioids. So I'm wondering, yeah, like back to sort of the question of like, is more always be better? Like, would you say that that's a reasonable conclusion for somebody in the public to draw that like, oh, maybe I want to work with ibogaine because that's going to open the critical period for me the longest and give me the m most opportunity to reshape um, my beliefs or attitudes around whatever thing is not serving them and is, is having some dysfunction in their life? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the truth is, is that I began, I mean, even Anne and Sasha Shulgin, who, you know, personally tested hundreds of psychedelics, Shul, uh, Alexander Shulgin was a chemist who created a bunch of novel psychedelics. Um, you know, their description of Ibogaine is, whew, that's a rough trip. And a lot of people mm -hmm. who take Ibogaine will say, wow. Uh, that was horrible. It lasted forever. <laughs> I never want to do Ibogaine ever again. Mm -hmm. um, but good news, I don't want to, you know, do heroin either. And so, you know, I think that part of the reason possibly that psychedelics are not really addictive for the most part is because, you know, it's it's hard work and it's emotionally exhausting, kind of the way that I described being a teenager, you know, it's hard work to be in that open state for a really long time. And I think that um, they are, there are going to be some people for whom that kind of long duration of having an insight and a trip, you know, it's just going to be too much. And so I can imagine that for some people, you kind of need to on-ramp them into being able to face those early traumatic memories by, you know, starting them off easy with, say, a ketamine or a couple of ketamines, some therapy, bring up some stuff. You know, I also worry that, you know, there's going to be an impulse uh, especially for Americans, right? We have this idea that, like, I see a problem, I got to dig it out, and I got to just get rid of it, and it's just got to be gone, and I'm not patient, and I don't want to have to sit with this pain anymore. Let's just remove it and be done with it, right? But I do think that there is a role for time and that, you know, if you overwhelm somebody with too much insight all at once, mm. it can overwhelm them and mm -hmm. cause them to collapse under the weight of all of that stuff that you brought up. And so you can imagine some therapeutic context where you would want to bring up just a little bit, give the person enough time to process that information, and then go back and dig deeper, and then go back and dig deeper, and have it be a process that lasts, you know, years rather than trying to take it out like a rotten tooth or something. Because, you know, some of these memories are really incorporated into so many elements of your life that you don't want to you know, inflict too much insight all at once, right? So I, I can certainly imagine that. I do think, though, the lesson of this proportionality is, is for all of those drug companies out there which are trying to engineer out the psychedelic side, of, side effects, right, of these drugs by reducing the duration of the psychedelic mm. effects, mm. or people who are focused on things like DMT, which is called the businessman's high because it's like intense, like jumping out of a helicopter and then 30 minutes later you've, you know, died, seen God, and come back to life. You know, that people are really focused on that because they think it's like more efficient and, you know, it'll save costs in the treatment rooms because, you know, people can just have their journey in it and be out of the hospital in an hour. And I think that our results are really saying that if you take a drug like Ibogaine and reduce its effects down to 30 minutes, well, then you just wasted a bunch of money because we already have that. We have ketamine for that, right? Like, but, you know, they can't, they can't patent that. They can't market right. that. They can't sell that. And I would just say the other analogy that I make to try and emphasize the difference between the learning model and the biochemical model of what psychedelics might be doing is, is that the learning model is a little bit like open mind surgery, right? So you're giving these drugs, you are, they're having an eight hour long experience, and then they need to be on rest and recovery and integration 
for weeks afterwards. And so you would never tell somebody who just had a stroke mm. or a heart attack, I'm mm. sorry, your therapy is too expensive because open heart surgery lasts eight hours and you have to be on bed rest for two weeks. Like nobody in their right mind would, you know, not reimburse that kind of therapy that's going to cure your, your clogged artery versus, you know, a drug that you have to be on for the rest of your life. But the neuropsychiatric and the, the big pharmaceutical companies and all of these chemists who are trying to come up with, you know, marketable compounds are hyper-focused on this old business model of don't treat the disease, don't cure the disease, medicalize people for life. They have to keep taking this pill. And nobody wants that, right? Like no, no person in the world would rather have to be dependent on a pill for the rest of their life when they could just have surgery, be on bed rest for two weeks and be done, right? Like that's just madness. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. Such brilliant points. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Ghoul. And be mindful of time. We should probably wrap things up soon. So before we do that, is there any last thing you want to share that you haven't had a chance to say yet? Oh my God. I think I just talked like super fast. I'm, I'm I think I'm done. <laughs> Okay. No, yeah. Great points. Yeah. No. I have one more yeah. question. I want to sneak in there, thinking mm -hmm. about what you just said, if I if I may, um, which is like, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the NDMA trials with humans and some of the ways people are working underground is to like have a session and then have another session four or six weeks later. So I'm curious in terms of repeated administration, let's say with um, MDMA, whether you have any sense of whether each time it would reopen the critical period in a comparable way. Yeah, we haven't really looked at that explicitly. My intuition is that yes, but I do, and, and that's based mostly on the fact that there, there are a couple of papers that have used sort of intermittent back-to-back -back ketamine, so once every day, mm -hmm. um, and um, to reopen inocular dominance critical period and the way they did it the six times back-to-back -back ketamine suggests to me that you know six times back-to-back -back ketamine is roughly the equivalent of one sort of LSD and so I think that's how people ha have you know accidentally come to the same idea that we have and so I think that for people with um, we don't know exactly what two weeks in a mouse translates into in a, in a human it's at least two weeks in a human but maybe it's two months and so we don't we don't really know exactly the timing of it that but that would be my my intuition that being said I would caution that you know I think that some part of the effect here and part of the mechanism which we're still working on is is that you sort of have to overwhelm the synapse and overwhelm the system in order to get the hard reset, right? So think the analogy that I've been using lately is, is that, you know, imagine that you've got a terrible uh, internet connection and it's just slow. And so, you know, it's slow and you're annoyed, but it still works and you don't freeze. But imagine that you've got a really bad internet connection or your computer's old and every 10 seconds or so, you go and you have these 30-second freezes of the monitor. Then eventually, with those sort of freezes of the monitor, you're going to reset either your program or your internet or your computer. And that's what I think psychedelics are doing. I think that they are resetting, they're, they're causing a reset because they're signaling to the cell, hey, something's frozen, that LSD molecule has been sitting in its receptor for four and a half hours when it really shouldn't be there for more than you know, 400 milliseconds, right? And so, you know, that that is sending a message like reset, reset, reset. And I'm a little bit concerned that every time you reset, those receptors get, you know, maybe internalized, changes the composition. And so it makes it harder to reset the next time. And that there would be a, you know, with repeated use, some sort of diminished experience. I don't know that to be true uh, because all of our studies were just looking at, you know, first time users of <laughs> MDMA or, you know, psychedelics in our mm -hmm, mice and optimuses. Right. But, you know, it's certainly something that we would want to be on the lookout for, especially as we look at the populations who are, you know, receiving ketamine therapy, you know, is there some 
decrease in the effect over time. Um, we, we certainly have reports from people who are microdosing that they build up tolerance to these drugs very quickly. And in fact, there's even some evidence that the way that SSRIs work is not by flooding the synapse with serotonin per se, but that flooding the synapse with serotonin is telling the cell, hey, we're getting too much serotonin signal, let's pull in those serotonin receptors. And it's that change in the serotonin receptor composition mm -hmm. that makes the lasting effects that take mm -hmm. so long to start in the, mm -hmm. in the beginning. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you, you have to kind of keep in mind that these are dynamic systems that are trying to restore a homeostatic balance always. And so if you overuse them, you could get to a point where the brain just turns off its reset mechanism and then, mm -hmm. and then you might be in trouble. So. Mm -hmm. cool. cool. Awesome. Thanks for that. Yeah. And with that, let's wrap things up. Um, thanks so much, Google, for sharing all your knowledge and insights. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, quick last plug for Melanie and I's course. So if anybody listening, maybe, you know, um, didn't feel like they can fully understand some of the neurobiological details we went into. Uh, me and Melanie do cover Google's work in detail in our course, as well as all the basics on psychedelic neuroscience from the receptors to the brain imaging findings, to the default mode network, to neuroplasticity, um, all within the lens or like a, an eye on practical applications in psychedelic therapy. So you can check out more about our course at uh, psychedeliceducationcenter.com. We're starting our second cohort very soon. And with that, thanks again, Cool, and thank you, Melanie. This has been a great, great chat here, and hope you mm -hmm. have the rest of the day, and same to our audience members. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay.